So I'm going to explain you the methodology for technology transfer at uh, the University of Genoa, and you're going to find that it's, as announced by Noelia, different, because different is a legislation, national one. And this has many consequences in terms of practice. So internal regulation and uh, practice differ from uh, what you have understand, not at the very low level, but how to arrive to that level. So at the end, what the, the university tried to do is to have an agreement for licensing and then some royalties. So the final, the final result will be the same, but uh, the trajectory is different <laughs> to arrive to this point. Basically, when we talk about uh, technology transfer, we have in mind uh, the opportunity to give a value for research activity. And of course, we have two ways. One is to spread them without any protection, and usually this is the most used one in academia because this leads to publications. And since many, many aspects of a career in academia relate to publication, you tend to publish. There is a natural incentive for publication because depending on your age index, depending on the number of papers, on your impact, blah, 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 you may get a better and better position. But at a certain point, this, when you are at the end of your position, except for Nobel Prize, you may think to announce uh, some uh, protection of your knowledge, uh, and this leads usually to aspect of technology transfer, meaning that uh, in this case you have two different opportunities. One to work on non-codified knowledge, and the other one is to code, work with codified knowledge. I must say from the beginning that the large fraction of knowledge is not codified. So most of the discussion we are doing at the moment uh, regard a minimum fraction of the knowledge that, that is available in academia. And that uh, scholars, researchers, etc. use for their business. What we get here is uh, when the system is codified by codified knowledge, since there is some code, it's clear, there is an evidence, you may go for licensing. If there is no other opportunity to have codified, you try to figure out the transfer agreement. And I hope to show you that, of course, this is quite tricky, not trivial, and slippery. <laughs> Why should one feel a patent? Patents are the typical reference element for codified knowledge that you try to file in order to protect your experience, uh, avoiding the use. First one is by mistake. You have no idea, you think that something is maybe useful, and you try to fill a paper. So fill a patent. And of course, uh, there's plenty of inventors everywhere, even self-paid inventors. Italy is a, I think that, uh, I know that in Italy there is a guy who has deposited something like 2,000 patents by his own. So pay directly, because you want to be labeled as inventor. Inventing anything. Second one, to have a lot of patents. And in some cases, this was also an evidence because there was a measure that uh, in terms of outcome of innovation, number of patents was an index, an indicator. And uh, especially during the 90s, the, two, the beginning of the 2000s, having a lot of patents, having a portfolio with an extremely huge number of patents, even for business, so for firms, company, was interesting. And uh, of course, what we hope to diffuse in terms of uh, element uh, is the opportunity that uh, registering a patent uh, is useful if you want to use it. So the other two should be in some sense discouraged, and uh, the use of uh, file should be considered as an outcome, not with the aim of excluding party, but with the aim of giving the possibility to have uh, exclusive exploitation of the outcome of the, of the innovation. And this typically leads to two options for university. First one uh, is to do this patenting in cooperation with other companies. And the last one is to do it within spin-off at the university. 
Again, I want to point you out already from the beginning that this is a minor fraction. Large fraction goes here, at least in our university. So as I mentioned, there is a change concerning uh, the constraint for the Koji transfer agreement, depending on the law. And uh, in Italian law, there is the so-called uh, professorship privilege, which means that the owner of the inventor, invention is the inventor. You respect it from his employment, which means that it's me, as a professor, inventing something, this does not belong to a university, it's mine. <laughs> this is completely different from the case of Alicante Ulerson because she said, Lauren said before, that uh, if a professor invents something, the invention belongs to the university. <laughs> so starting from the beginning, aiming the same aim, which is at the end for the university to have a licensing of patents, how to reach the, how to reach the, the final goal, so to bridge the gap. In our case, uh, there is only one option, to have a transfer agreement from the scholar to the university. And this is done by incentives, which means that, as we are going to see, the registration of a patent is paid completely by the university in case there is a, a transfer of ownership from the professor to the university. And then start. So what I'm anticipating what does work. But what, what happened at the beginning is since I'm the owner, as inventor of a property, right? The only way the university can achieve them is because I transfer to your university. But again, this points out, out one, one element. In principle, there is no incentive to codify uncodified knowledge. Because if the knowledge is in my own, and I may use it without any patent, there is no reason for me to transfer it to the university that can license it to someone else. So as you can understand, this becomes something really slippery, not trivial, to get policy in that direction. As I mentioned, so... What, what happened? Please. What happened if someone has research and doesn't want to patent it? So if someone has a research and doesn't want to patent it, does it happen? Yes, it happened. Even software, for example, it happened. Mm -hmm. Simply use it without any kind of, in principle, of obligation, except from the ethical point of view. So you may decide that since you have developed this element with university, you want to have an agreement with university. But it's your own. It's an ethical issue. It's not a legal one. Ethically, you may decide to use that uncodified knowledge to develop something in business and to transfer some of the revenues to the university. But it's an ethical one. It's an ethical issue. I don't know if some university has some some country has this kind of legislation, as we have in Italy, which is very strong, because giving the ownership to the professorship, to the professor, open a lot of 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 element. Please note that this condition only works with uh, research uh, in public body. So public university, public research center, does not uh, work with a private company of private university. In case of private company, any invention belongs to the company. But since we are, we are discussing about uh, academic spin-off, I must stress this point because it is a crucial one. So as I mentioned, the opportunity has uh, from any innovation, invention, coming from research activity is uh, first uh, to register it by its own, paying directly, and making all the bureaucracy parts, or as mentioned there, transfer the ownership to university, which obtain the right to file a patent application in the name of the inventors, which is always labeled as inventor, 
but the ownership belongs to the university in that case. And uh, I must say that uh, for the patent uh, at the university, this is most frequent case. But as I mentioned, there is a tendency not to to file many, as many patents as possible. How is the procedure for patenting? Again, here is the process. They try to describe all the different steps that are performed within the university by the technology transfer office. So there is an office dedicated to, to this goal. And uh, it starts with a preliminary issue, try to evaluate the novelty of the system. Then there is uh, a record of invention which is kept all confidential. So there is, uh, there is a no disclosure agreement between inventor and university. Then, uh, if this is overcome, there is a transfer of ownership, of ownership to the university, the possibility to evaluate uh, the patent registration, the submission to the board, who have uh, to decide whether to patent or not, and then, if it is approved, uh, the patent attorney is selected, and uh, the patent application is written and submitted. So basically, again, what you see is uh, something that relates uh, the inventors, and then uh, the aggregate of academia entering to decide whether it is uh, interesting to be patent or not. <coughs> the research in this sense uh, that uh, is willing to patent uh, transferring the ownership of the university is required to fill a form that tries to describe the invention, in details, which is confidential. So at this stage, there is a no disclosure agreement, which means that uh, if it goes to the end, there will be a transfer of agreement. If not, no one who has uh, got access to the, to the description and details of the invention may have consequences in application, because this is, of course, uh, stated by specific agreement of no disclosure. Then. If there is an interest, uh, it start writing uh, the form to transfer the ownership to the university, and there are the evaluation of patentability criteria using some database. For example, we use uh, a SpaceNet, which is a database that try to compare the different patents available and find out if there is a gap or if there is an overlap, etc. And uh, once that. Uh, you had uh, evaluated the patentability, it goes to the board. The board is, uh, in principle, the decision maker, irrespective to the spin off. If you remember when I talked yesterday, the spin off was created, uh, what happened? Was created uh, with a decision taken by the board of directors. In case of patents, uh, it is devoted. Uh, so there is a, a deployment in decision to the board of, uh, of research and technology transfer. And uh, once it has been decided, uh, the TTO asks for patent attorney, at least three, to compare cost. And uh, assignment uh, for registration is given to the one with the minimal cost. So it's a cost-based. Uh, selection, and uh, the researcher should at that time work with patent attorney in order to write the patent application, and the cost for that are completely covered by the university. So this is the only, the only way we have found uh, to stimulate uh, transfer knowledge agreement between professor researcher and university, the cost. In principle, researchers have to pay some specific attention, in particular to check the requirement for profitability, to negotiate the intellectual property rights, and also to sign specific non-disclosure agreement to third party. And uh, the final point is, uh, since uh, patent uh, is uh, useful in the case one want to exploit it, uh, researchers also ask to 
give effort on the commercial exploitation of the invention. And uh, in this case, there is in principle a stimulus to, to create a spin off. Current number point out that this solution is not so frequently used. And I'm going to show this up. So, the opportunity after filling a patent is uh, to understand what kind of uh, requirements there are, which kind of market can be found, and uh, in this sense, uh, different opportunity do arise from uh, having other development, uh, from licensing, from scaling up to create a spin-off, and uh, all of them in principle are considered by the technology transfer office, office supported uh, to the researcher so that uh, together it's possible to find out the best solution. And I want to mention in this sense that uh, a lot of work uh, is really for the technology transfer office uh, to support the researcher because most of them have no idea of what can be the options for using the outcome of an invention. In the case of spin-off company interested in exploiting the patent application, the spin-off should again contact the Transfer Technology Office, which is the front-end for any communication concerning patent. What is done in this case is uh, to provide the interested spin-off uh, with a form which describes basically all the license agreement. If this okay in terms of uh, basic uh, regulation, the license agreement is filled with uh, specific information and uh, if there are only minor changes, minor changes, the agreement does not link any longer to get back to the board. So it's possible to be signed directly by the deputy rector with a spin-off. Must be said that uh, the basic license term of a spin-off uh, licensing are related to the possibility to use patent by the, by the spin-off and this kind of license is uh, exclusive and worldwide so in principle, the spin-off is the only one who has the opportunity. But the university retains the right to use the invention for, the invention for publication, for the research, the application and teaching, so the basic activity of university, which is not business but research and teaching. And in principle, it also assumes no sub-licensing. Of course, as you see, there is but because of licensing becomes a crucial aspect. Becomes a crucial aspect because, uh, as we are going to see, in many cases, spin-off need to cooperate to large company in order to really exploit the patent. So the issue of sub licenses, again, uh, is, is in a gray level, and we must discuss a little bit. The university covers all the patent costs during the time that the company is considered a spin-off, which in principle is three plus three years. But as I mentioned, there has been a change in the legislation, the design and regulation that put three plus three plus infinity three. <laughs> so in principle, it can be forever. But uh, irrespective to being uh, a spin-off of a university, you have to pay some royalties. A reduced number of royalties, I'm going to explain you the exact numbers, over a threshold of a net, cam, net income, net income that is uh, derived from the specific business activity related to the patent. Otherwise, it will be quite complex again. This is the model used for all the patent licenses to, un to University of Genoa. However, as I mentioned, there are some problems. You have seen some bads. First bad is no sub-licensing, because for a spin-off company, it may become crucial to have a relationship with other bigger company. 
and in that case there might be the possibility for the spin-off to give the right to assess the spin-off, the patent, the patent right to other companies. This is not being closed formally because it was uh, in principle considered uh, only the general no sub-licensing, but in practice uh, there are some exchange letters in which the spin-off is asking this possibility and the university says yes. So in principle is no, in practice is yes. <laughs> we are Italian, we have to find the solution. <laughs> The second one is royal calculation because, uh, as I mentioned, royal calculation is a percentage of a net income coming from the business activity related to the specific patent. In this sense, uh, the percentage is different, but there is one aspect concerning what is uh, net income. And in particular, concerning net income, uh, there has been some works. Net income should also include the possible investment, future investment, which in principle are in different exercises in accounting, not only one year. Second point is uh, it should be fixed uh, above a certain threshold. In principle, was for any level of net income larger than zero. Now it's for any level of income larger than 50,000 euro. 50,000 euro. But as a counterpart, a minimum of royalty has been introduced, which is 1,000 euro. So the net key income enter above 50,000, but you have to pay at least a minimum of 1,000. If you remember, this is similar to Alicante because Alicante says you have to pay 3,000, but the two, year, the two initial year are for free. For us, it's 1,000 every time, even for the first year. So in three years, it's the same amount. So as you see, there is a practice at the end which is quite similar. Another key point uh, that came up is uh, what happened is the invention take place uh, not before the creation of the spin-off, but after the creation of the spin-off. If it is uh, created uh, after, the born of a spin-off, of course, uh, this is something uh, in joint cooperation between university and spin-off. So again, something should be defined in terms of uh, transfer agreement. And the solution we have found is that uh, this is almost similar, except for this part. There is no longer a transfer agreement to the university but it will be a joint ownership, usually 50% belongs to the university and 50% belonging to the spin-off. Must be said at this point that there is another key point, because, because in the case the invention, so the patent, took place in a spin-off after the spin-off has been created, the professor privilege does not apply, because the spin-off is a private company. So it is done when the professor is serving a private company because he's working for the private company, the researcher is working for the private company. In that case, it's no longer a public body. And so this privilege clause close up. And there is no, no longer discussion. It's your, the, you are the owner as inventor. You should transfer no longer because the invention belongs directly to both spin-off and university. Fixes this point, the process remains the same. So there is an agreement between spin-off and university concerning the fraction of ownership, and then it goes for approval from the board, for registration, patentability, all the process I've discussed before. Now some data, as usual, because I think they're usually interesting. Currently, in general, there are 90 patents in portfolio, nothing active patents. Of this, only four are licenses to spin-off, and one is going to be dismissed. 
and only three are jointly registered by university and spin-off. So, small fraction. And this again points you out that uh, since the number of spin-off is 47, there is no relationship between patent and spin-off. Spin-off are not patent-based company. A knowledge-based company, but not patent. This will be my last slide, I want to remark it. It is always true that spin-off are knowledge-based company, but this points out that uh, doesn't, there is no need to have codified knowledge to create the spin-off. As regarding royalties at the University of Genova, the basic rule that uh, it is necessary to pay 5% of the income, net income arising from business activity related to the patent. But if you are a spin-off of university, this reduced to 2%. Okay? So these are our rules. And of course, last slide. What uh, if there is no patent? So the knowledge is not codified. In principle, it is assumed the possibility to have also knowledge as well, know-how transfer agreement. But, but this is rather than trivial. This is rather than trivial because the knowledge uh, sometimes is difficult to be identified, sometimes it's difficult to be qualified, and uh, especially in the case of a researcher is shareholder of a company, his knowledge uh, can be used by the company without any formalized agreement because it is in his ownership. So any tentative in this case was mostly related to ethical issue. So there is an ethical stimulus of uh, of, uh, how to say, of uh, recognizing uh, the, the relationship with the university, that the, anything which has been developed was a consequence of being employed by the university in order to stimulate this kind of uh, transfer agreement. Some of them has been signed, so more than one, but uh, again, uh, it is uh, a policy rather than a regulation, mm -hmm. because the regulation, the legislation is in favor of the inventor. As I mentioned, legislation produce a lot of effect in consequence, so the stimulus can only be made by policy, ethical, and other aspect. I think I finished. I don't know if it was useful. If you have any question, I'm available to give you some more insight concerning our experience. Of course, if you need the form, I don't know if it is already uploaded. If not, I will. The form for the transfer agreement. Well, I have a question in the know-how part. Do you charge any payment to the spin-off for using the know-how or the knowledge of the university? Uh, in principle, if there is an agreement for know-how or knowledge transfer, that agreement fixes uh, what will be the royalties, so what you have to pay. Must be said, uh, I have already mentioned yesterday, I'm going to explain you later because there is another lecture concerning shareholders, that uh, at the University of Genoa, the spin-off have to pay a fraction of the income paid to staff, so employees of the university, which is the responsibility of a spin-off to transfer directly. So there is an implicit uh, payment for the knowledge related to the fraction of the income. So if a researcher I receive from a spin-off, as I mentioned yesterday, 100,000 euro, the spin-off should pay to the university 10,000 euro. 
which in fact is uh, a way to overcome the condition of absence of transfer agreement concerning knowledge and know-how. Okay, perfect. Okay, um, maybe it's not a question, maybe I just want to make sure that I understand correctly. Um, so if it's about know-how, you do not always sign a transfer contract. You sometimes sa you sign it, sometimes not, if it's not about a patent. If it is just know our knowledge, you sign it only based on the proponent. So, okay. because in principle you have no way to... And maybe as an understand. inventor you don't have a benefit because it's not a patent that the university will pay for. Right. So right. why should you... But uh, I'm just... Exactly, exactly. The only way we have found uh, is concerning codified knowledge because in that case the cost for patenting for licensing a patent uh, is paid by the university. So there is an economic incentive. There is more one because uh, it's few few thousand of euros, not a big, not a large fraction. 